Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steven Herrera Tenorio, and I'm a first year PhD student in the Joint Sociology and Demography program here at Berkeley. Um, it's good to see everyone here, and I'm excited to introduce our guest today. Um, Sam Trejo is an assistant professor of sociology at Princeton University. Professor Trejo is a quantitative so social scientist interested in how social and biological factors jointly shape human development across the life course. Furthermore, Professor Trejo specializes in quasi-experimental, biosocial, and computational methods, and the research capitalizes on two data sources that until recently were unavailable to researchers, one, large administrative data sets, and two, longitudinal studies containing molecular genetic data. We are very excited to have Professor Trejo here at Berkeley Demography giving today's presentation titled, Learning from Flint, the Health and Social Effects of the Flint Water Crisis on Educational Outcomes. With that, I'll pass it on to you, Professor Trejo. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I did my PhD at, over at Stanford and actually um, Ben Domang was my advisor. And so, uh, you know, who is the partner of um, Amal. So big friend of the, the department, big fan of the house, uh, big fan of Berkeley more generally. I'm actually kind of sad. I, I only got to live in Palo Alto and San Francisco, but I think I like kind of the Oakland, Berkeley area the best. Um, my brother went to college there, so I got to visit him a lot. Uh, I went to University of Texas for undergrad. Um, but so anyways, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, this paper. There's a working paper out, so you can kind of Google the title and um, find that if you'd like. Um, and this is probably the last talk that I'll give on this one because you know, I've been working on this for a long time and the paper's under review. Um, but anyway, so the title is Learning from Flint, the, the Psychosocial Effects of the Flint Water Crisis uh, on School-Age Children. Um, and so just as an overview, you know, I'm going to briefly talk about this other paper, um, and, and really this is just going to be to, um, it's on school shootings, um, it's really just to introduce kind of counterfactuals and, and difference and difference methods. I think um, that, you know, counterfactuals and difference and differences is going to be something that's, you know, very familiar to a lot of the demography folks, um, but uh, hopefully doing this will allow us to not only, um, you know, talk about, uh, you know, the results of the Flint project, but also zoom in on synthetic control methods, which I think I think the methods in particular might be sort of interesting, and there's a lot of interesting work in this area, actually, and a lot of it at Berkeley. Um, so, uh, so, so we'll talk about school shooting kind of briefly, and then we'll get into the kind of the meat of the presentation, the Flint water crisis, um, and and we'll talk sort of dig digression there about synthetic control methods and kind of what they're doing and how they work, um, and then kind of conclude things and have time for Q and A at the end. Um, you know, you're welcome to ask questions during. It's a little hard to. I'm not going to really monitor the chat, but um, you know, people can kind of jump in and, and flag if you can, if you yeah. need. Sam, we'll, we'll monitor the chat for you so we can um, jump in if, if there's clarifying questions. That's great. That's great. Um, so this was a paper, um, Exposure to School Shootings and Youth Antidepressant Use. Um, this was led by Dr. Meyer Rossenplater. So I worked on this um, while at Stanford. She's at the med school there. Um, and, and basically, the, the, the question we asked here was, like, does a fatal school shooting um, uh, you know, occurring in a child's school affect her mental health? And, and if so, by how much? Um, kind of fits into this literature on the long reach of violence. So, you know, exposure to you know, these traumatic events maybe extends beyond those who are physically harmed or even present, right? What if you know the people affected? Um, and so you know, the idea is that not that many students have actually been harmed by a school shooting in the, in the past 20 years, but a lot of students have been in schools. So over 240,000 students you know, have had a shooting in their school in the past 20 years. Um, and, and of course, the, you know, sort of the big sort of identification issue here is that the, the students, schools, cities um, that experience shootings are really different than those did not. Um, so, so it's kind of, you know, you, you, this sort of makes a challenge for um, identifying causal effects, right? And so to identify a causal effect, we would want to construct a counterfactual, um, you know, what would have happened in the absence of treatment? Um, and here we're just sort of operating under the potential outcomes framework. Um, and we're all sort of building up to uh, talk about the Flint paper again, which, which I think uses some of these interesting developments in, in panel data methods that have kind of occurred in the last few years. Um, so this was one of the, you know, the main figures of the, the school shootings paper. So we have um, on the x-axis here, uh, it's um, months relative to the shooting. So here's two years before the shooting, here's two years after. Um, and then this is the y-axis is a, a rate of antidepressant use. Um, and so we see that, you know, there's a kind of a secular increase in antidepressant use among children, just in general, um, occurring kind of over the panel of our data, which is like basically the past 20 years. And then when a school shooting occurs, we see this spike and, and, it, and it persists sort of as long as we can see in our data. Um, you know, so in order to you know identify a causal effect, we'd want to find a comparable control group um, that shares the same pretrend as a treatment group. You know, so like the, the same slope. This is kind of the common trends assumption. Um, so you know, we, this is students living sort of in zero to five miles, which is like about the size of school catchment areas. 
Um, so here, we, we one of the control groups we use is um, students living 10 to 15 miles away. So in the same city, but, but that attend different schools. Um, and we see that there, you know, there is sort of good common trends. Um, they seem to, you know, in the pretreatment period, match each other. Um, and so basically, the strategy we're using with difference and differences is um, so the control groups post trend becomes the treated groups counterfactual, right? So we have this red con this control group post treatment trend. We're basically going to slide it on up um, and make it the treated groups counterfactual. Um, and there, that difference between sort of the, the treated groups, you know, observed outcome, and then what we think would have happened that imputed counterfactual, that sort of becomes the, the causal effect. So we found in this case there was about a twenty percent increase um, in the use of antidepressants. Um, you know, and this is called difference in differences. Um, and so there's plenty we could say about this paper, but but we're just going to sort of build off of this foundation and when we talk about Flint. Um, so the paper I'm talking about here, yeah, the psychosocial effects of the Flint water crisis on school children. And I just want to flag, um, this is joint work, um, also Gloria Yemens Maldonado, who's at um, uh, you know, UT Med School, um, and then Brian Jacobs, who's at the University of Michigan School of Public Policy. Um, and so this is a project that, you know, I've been working on for a long time, I began as a graduate student, and then later sort of added new data and added co-authors, and I presented it at Flint and, you know, sort of other conferences around the US, and so now we have a working paper out that you can check out. So, you know, before we dive into kind of what analysis we did, it's sort of important to have a shared understanding of the timeline of the Flint water crisis. Um, so, you know, what happened so before, way before the crisis is that in 2011, um, the city of Flint is bankrupt. And so the Michigan uh, you know, state government appoints a string of emergency city managers. Um, so if you've seen the show Parks and Recreation, this happens in the first few seasons. Basically, the, there's these people coming in from outside um, the city and they're kind of supplanting the local government, right? Um, uh, in order to sort of sort through the budget troubles. Um, in 2014, so this is really when the water crisis begins, in order to save money, the Flint water supply is switched from Lake Huron, which is kind of the same water supply as Detroit, uh, to the Flint River, so a river that runs through the heart of Flint. Um, and so the river water was corrosive and it wasn't properly treated. Um, so lead from the pipes um, uh, beneath the city, you know, in particular service lines, but we'll talk about that later, um, began to leach into the tap water. And so almost immediately residents noticed like changes to the color, the odor, and the taste of their water. Um, so I just want to kind of show you like this is pretty gnarly water coming out after the switch, right? So this is what the, this is a resident, um, you know, showing what she's filling up from her sink. Um, you know, a, a key part of the crisis, I think, and this is probably why it became such a national scandal in many ways, is that in 2015 or through 2015, the city of Flint officials and, and state officials as well, they're publicly insisting that the tap water is totally safe to drink. Um, so the mayor of Flint even, you know, drinks tap water on live TV. Um, so this is him doing that. Uh, he did not win re-election, unsurprisingly. Um, and, you know, so, so the water was changed in April 2014, and then in 2016, finally, the crisis was really acknowledged. Um, so the state of emergency is declared, the EPA sees eminent and substantial endangerment, the National Guard comes in, distributes bottled water, and then the city of Flint actually begins replacing the lead service lines. Um, these, you know, the lines that connect individual houses to uh, the larger water mains, and those are sort of the typical culprits that are likely to be made of lead. Um, so when the crisis finally broke, uh, citizens of Flint had been exposed to lead contaminated water for about a year and a half. Um, and the majority black city quickly became a symbol um, of government negligence and racial injustice. Um, and actually the, the percent of children with high lead levels in their blood, you know, high being above the CDC threshold, uh, five micrograms per deciliter, um, uh, increased from 2.5% to 5% of kids. Um, and this is a mean increase of about 0.5 micrograms per deciliter. I'm just kind of flagging this number now because we're going to come back to it. Um, it, and it's going to be sort of an important number. Um, and, you know, one reason we want to study Flint is that, that tragically sort of, even though the amount of attention is, is, was uncommon for Flint, these sort of lead poisons are actually not that uncommon from, from water, for example. Um, you know, just down the road from where I am um, in Newark, uh, there was uh, a water crisis a few years ago, um, you know, of a similar magnitude to Flint. And there's been kind of other prominent cases in DC, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, and, and, and more cities in the last 20 years. Um, so why is this a problem? Um, so lead is a neurotoxin, even low doses sort of negatively impact cognition and behavior. Um, and, and mostly it's thought to affect kids under the age of five. Um, and in the US, at least there's two main sources of, of lead exposure, um, paint and, and plumbing, um, with plumbing being sort of the, the second most common after paint. Um, and we're gonna obviously focus on plumbing today because that's what happened in Flint. Um, uh, but so lead contamination and plumbing requires two things. First, there has to be lead pipes. Um, uh, you know, there can also be uh, lead in other things around the house. So like sometimes there's really old fixtures like sinks and stuff like that that have lead in it. Um, but, but typically it's, we're thinking lead service lines buried beneath the ground um, and therefore for difficult to observe and, and costly to replace. We have to have lead pipes, but having lead pipes alone actually isn't a problem. Um, you have to have lead pipes and you also have to have corrosive water. 
So the, so the combination of those two things um, really kind of create uh, the, the issue. Um, and this actually makes lead and water really kind of uniquely difficult to contain um, because it enters you know, through each house's service lines, right? Um, so you know, it's unknown which houses have lead service lines and it can be really hard to find out. Um, and then, and you can't measure it at the treatment plant, right? With most other sort of um, uh, water contaminants, it, it can be measured and treated at the plant, but but here, sort of entering entering um, at the end of the at, at the end of the chain in people's homes. Um, so so you know, with a lot of things, right? Um, there's kind of a social patterning. So so there's a large literature on the social patterning of lead pipes, um, lead paint. Um, you know, but there's very different. You know, excuse me. So there's a large literature on the social patterning of lead paint, right? A lot of that has to do with um, houses that are kind of breaking apart and decrepit because the, the old paint um, you know, that hasn't been used in many years is now exposed. Um, but there's actually pretty little uh, uh, literature on the social patterning of lead pipes. And, and what I would argue is that they're both socially patterned, but sort of in really different ways. Um, so for paint, um, social risk is conferred at the household level. So it, the question is, do you live in an old house with deteriorating paint? Um, you know, it, it's gonna, and then, and then um, the, for plumbing, it's, it's social risk, I think, really exists at the community level, or, or at least the combination of the community level and individual level, which is, which is, do you live in a house with lead pipes in a municipality that, that fails to properly treat its water? Um, so going back to that list of cities I rattled off earlier, Flint, Newark, Pittsburgh, Providence, DC, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, I mean, this is a pretty non-random set of cities, right? So they're, 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 um, they're cities with large black and, and in Providence, Latino populations, um, historically places that have received a lot of southerners during the Great Migration, kind of older industrial cities um, that have faced a decline in poverty in recent years. Um, so you can kind of make a theoretical model for, for how uh, lead exposure through water is patterned. Um, so at the top, we have these kind of structural forces like race, poverty, industry, geography, and that those sort of um, lead to failures of important public institutions, in, in this case, it's water treatment. Um, and then sort of that leads to an environmental health exposure. Here it's lead. Um, and then sort of we're looking at um, the effects on child development, but specifically quantified as, as educational outcomes. Um, I guess I'll pause there and check the chat to make sure there's no questions. Um, yeah, I think, OK. I think we're good, Sam. Great. Um, so just moving right along. Um, so what are the goals of, of our project here? One, we want to quantify the cost of this kind of import, important historical event. Uh, and education records are actually some, some of the only longitudinal data that's available for virtually all uh, Flint children, both before and after the water crisis. Um, and we're interested in impacting everything that went into the crisis, not just the lead. Um, so in particular, we're interested in exploring the social effects of living in a town experiencing a crisis. So, you know, we, we, we don't really know what's going on here, but we can imagine things like stigma, marginalization, social unrest. There were certainly protests happening in Flint. Um, uh, and, and so this has like broader implications beyond the Flint water crisis or beyond the study of lead and plumbing more generally. Um, and we also want to learn more about the cognitive and behavioral effects of lead. Um, um, we're one of the early or first causal, causal studies of lead poisoning in older children, um, uh, mostly because the, the past causal studies have, have used uh, variation in um, basically enforcement of policies that uh, target kids under the age of five. And so um, I, I would actually probably remove the, you know, I think we're one of the few or early studies of causal, uh, causal studies of lead poisoning in older children. I don't know if we're actually the first. Um, and then I, we also highlight the burden of lead pipes in the US today. So still about 20 million Americans um, receive plumbing through lead, uh, or receive water through lead plumbing. Okay, so, so what's our research plan? Here we actually have two kind of parallel empirical strategies. Um, the first is a between district analysis. Um, so here, what we're doing is we're comparing all Flint children, um, all children living in Flint to similar children living elsewhere in Michigan, both before and after the crisis. Um, so this is gonna say, you know, compare, this is gonna capture really broad mechanisms of the crisis, right? So it'll capture the effects of lead, but it'll also capture sort of um, anything like stigma, marginalization, civil unrest, um, right? It's just anything that changed, you know, after the crisis in Flint um, that didn't change elsewhere in Michigan. And then we also have a within Flint analysis. Um, so here we're comparing Flint children who lived in homes with, with lead pipes to those living in homes with copper pipes before and after the crisis. Um, and so copper pipes are kind of safe, even, even with corrosive water, whereas lead pipes are gonna leach and, and create lead poisoning. Um, so this is really focusing on this narrow mechanism. These are all Flint children, and we're looking at the difference between the ones that have lead pipes and the ones that have copper pipes. So we're zooming in on the effects of lead. Um, and by estimating both of these models, we have some, some leverage to separate out the lead mechanisms from everything else. Um, so we're, we're kind of able to separate the, 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 the direct effects in a way from kind of these broader, um, more community level effects. 
Um, in terms of data, we're using the Michigan Department of Education's restricted use longitudinal education records. Um, this is really high quality data. Um, it's a little annoying to get access to. Um, so all Michigan public school students, um, and, and you know, we're going to use all of them uh, as part of our synthetic control analysis, and many of them. But but we're really focusing on you know, in many ways, the 17,000 Flint students each year. Um, so that's kind of basically our sample size. Um, and Flint has very low private school attendance rates, so we think this basically captures um, the, the vast, vast majority of students. Um, so it also we have demographic characteristics, um, educational outcomes. So we're focusing particularly on four of them: math achievement and reading achievement, as well as um, special needs, a fraction of kids eligible for a special need, and um, and then daily attendance. And and again, not because we think it's the right thing to do um, in terms of like we we would love to you know explore heterogeneity here, but we're using public school records, which, which just inherently focuses on kids above the age of five. Um, and and um, by and large, the vast majority of people were exposed to the Flint water crisis at above the age of five. So, so we're really looking at older lead effects, which is sort of a, a kind of a key difference of our study and, and might sort of explain some of the results. Um, so just to give sort of an example here, um, you know, we're here on the y-axis, we have math achievement and on the x-axis we have um, year and so this is the the trend in standard deviation units of the of the statewide distribution um, of math achievement in Flint. So they have quite low math achievement, right? It's you know negative 0.6, negative 0.7 standard deviations, but it's increasing over time um, in the pre-treatment period before the crisis. Um, and then when the crisis happens, um, and I guess I'm gonna, I'll flag that throughout the talk I'll, I'll use math achievement as sort of our running you know candidate outcome because um, I think some of the most interesting results are on math achievement. Um, and, and after the crisis, um, we see actually just like a precipitous observational drop in math achievement. Um, so, so uh, you know, there's something suggestive of a causal effect, but again, these trends are striking, but they're just only observational, right? So there could be a lot of things going on, year-to-year -year changes in economic conditions, standardized tests, et cetera. Um, so we need some sort of counterfactual. Uh, we need uh, the, the, you know, what would have happened, you know, would have, in the absence of the water crisis, would Flint's test scores continue to increase? Would they have decreased? Um, we don't know. Um, so here we're trying to identify causation. Um, so we have to construct a counterfactual using a control group. And, and I guess the, the, the thing I want to flag is that in Flint, this is actually really challenging. Um, Flint is a really unique district in the state of Michigan. Um, it's, it's large, but not huge. Um, so it's large, but you know, not nearly the size of, for example, Detroit. Um, it has got many students who are black. I um, mean, it's got many students who are economically disadvantaged. And, and with sort of the few, few districts that are kind of relatively similar to Flint, we don't really see common trends. Um, so we don't just have one that we can kind of plug into a difference and difference analysis. Um, so, so what do we do? Um, uh, again, here is uh, on the y-axis, we have fraction black and um, fraction of black students, for example. And then um, on the x-axis, we have fraction economically disadvantaged students. So this is just free reduced price lunch. Um, and we can see Flint is right here. Um, so Flint's really kind of, you know, I'm just trying to highlight, there's the kind of need of the distribution for the state of Michigan. You can see this is Detroit up here and, and here's Flint. Um, and there's just, I'm just trying to highlight that there's very few, um, there, there's very few districts to kind of, that are similar enough to Flint to think we might be able to use them as a counterfactual. And none of them just seem to have the, the common trends that we're looking for. Um, so this is how we're getting kind of into synthetic control, but what do we do when common trends fail? Um, synthetic control. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of talk about some of the intuitions here. Um, so it's got, synthetic control began about a decade ago with this early version, um, this Abadi, Diamond, and Heinmuller paper. Um, but actually in practice, synthetic control applications today depart pretty substantially from this original formulation. Um, and I'll discuss you know, what we do in, in, in the paper and, and what people are starting to do nowadays. Um, so Susan Athey and Hugh Imbens um, at Stanford, they said um, synthetic controls are arguably the most important innovation in the policy evaluation literature in the last 15 years. So just to kind of get you excited, um, the general idea is that we can generate a synthetic flint as a counterfactual. Um, it, uh, we use a weighted average of control districts that do ma match Flint's trends. Um, so in some sense, this is a generalization of difference and differences. Um, so the weights add up to one. So for example, we have synthetic Flint, or at least in our formulation, they add up to one. Um, so a synthetic Flint might be kind of 0.5 of Lansing, um, 0.33 of Kalamazoo plus 0.17 Detroit. So even though Lansing, Kalamazoo, and Detroit individually don't have common trends with Flint, um, they're sort of weighted average might, um, and, 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 and we can make a synthetic control. So like I said, synthetic control is a generalization of difference and differences. It brings difference and differences into the age of big data. Um, and so it's got some nice properties. So one is that it computationally automates counterfactual selection and actually sort of bakes in some of the error that, 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 that you know, is part of this process where, where with difference and differences, this kind of happens under the table or before the paper um, is, is uh, you know, presented. 
So basically what happens is an algorithm finds the weighted average of control units that best approximates the treated unit. Um, and then, you know, in doing so, this actually greatly expands the space of common trends available, right? Because now we don't just have the individual, uh, you know, control units, we have kind of all the combinations of their weighted averages. Um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about what we do. So what's our synthetic control? Um, there are many different, different versions of synthetic control. In a lot of ways, I think the literature is still in its adolescence. It's kind of starting to crystallize. I mean, it's already a lot more crystallized today than it was, you know, three or four years ago when I started working on this paper. Um, our synthetic control is relatively unique. Um, so we match only on trends, um, so not levels. Um, this is sort of called demeaned or intercept shifts in data control um, and can be expressed, you know, so our estimator can be expressed as just basically a weighted difference in differences. Um, and, and it resembles um, a couple proposals in the literature. So one is um, Ben Michael, Feller, and Rothstein, which are all um, Berkeley professors. They have this augmented synthetic control method. So we use a very kind of specific, simple version of their method. Um, or it, it can also be expressed as this um, Arkelinsky et al. paper. It's just called synthetic difference in differences. Um, anyway, so we're matching only on trends and we fit all four of our outcomes simultaneously. So um, we just make a single synthetic flint for all four of our outcomes. Um, so there's one weighted average of uh, there's one weighted average of you know the Michigan control districts that makes up um, you know the, our synthetic flint and that same synthetic flint is a synthetic flint for math achievement, reading achievement, uh, special needs, and and um, attendance. And we do this for a couple of reasons. Um, conceptually, it's sort of unsatisfying to have many synthetic flints, right? Why you know why is our counterfactual you know districts you know A through D in one case and districts you know um, E through uh, J in another case, like it's it's not so clear um, why that would be nice, and and, and actually there's sort of a, a sweet spot statistically in terms of the um, amount of um, uh, data you get synthetic control and, and and what kind of precision you can get. And it just so happens that that, that and it, this works better for us. Uh, and I can talk about that more later. Um, so so I think there's just a way in which synthetic control is really opaque. Like it can kind of seem like magic, right? Um, and, and I think uh, yeah, I was at least a little skeptical about synthetic control um, before I learned a lot more about it. Um, and I think there's still reasons that we should be um, cautious in, in interpreting and using synthetic control. But, but I think there's a really nice um, visual explanation that sort of tells you what's going on here and, and really kind of how it relates to difference and differences. Uh, so I'm gonna take this little bit of a digression to kind of a brief graphical, graphical guide of synthetic control. Um, and, and I just wanna flag that this is like made up data. Like I'm, I'm creating like a very simple example here um, to talk about what's going on. And we're, we're gonna go back to the real data in a sec, um, but, and I'll let you know when that is. But, but so imagine that um, this is what sort of our situation looks like where we had Flint um, and for simplicity, we really only have three time periods here. Um, and this is all the pre-treatment period you'll notice, right? Because um, we're, we're um, doing our counterfactual selection process before treatment occurs, right? Before there's kind of something systematically different about the treatment group and the control group. Um, so we have three data points um, we have Flint and then we have three other um, 2001, 2007, and 2013. And we have three other uh, control units. Um, we have Lansing, uh, Kalamazoo, uh, and Detroit. And so what is, you know, demeaned intercept shift, for example, uh, synthetic control doing? Well, the first step that we were doing, um, you know, what we do in our paper is basically we're, we're demeaning um, everybody. Uh, and you can kind of think about this graphically. It's a little easier to, to show it as um, we're just basically subtracting off the first uh, data point. Um, so, so we're we're sliding everybody down to zero, um, but uh, so that we're matching only on trends, not on levels. Um, and then, you know, just to make it more visually appealing, I'm just going to focus. I'm going to expand this new kind of slid down version of the trends all the way up to the to the whole uh, graph. Um, and so now we have the demeaned version of of this plot, or really it's the you know the minus the first data point, where everybody starts at zero. Um, and what I want to highlight is that this data can be expressed in sort of an identical way. Um, that, like data that's identical to this can be expressed in, um, in a different way that I think a little more useful in understanding what synthetic control is doing. Um, so I slide that plot over here. This is that same um, you know, slid down trends plot we had. Um, and then I have this new way of visualizing it, right? Um, so the reason I subtracted the first off rather than the mean, um, it doesn't really matter mathematically, but um, it does matter uh, uh, just for the visualization, is that now everybody's got the same 2001 point. So we're really just left with two data points where the, the different districts might vary. We have 2007 and we have 2013. So, you know, because we only have two data points where they vary, we can express identical, all of this information in a kind of a different way, here, right? So rather than having um, the outcome, uh, you know, on the y-axis and year on the x-axis, we can have, 
the outcome in year 2013 on the y-axis and the outcome in year 2007 on the x-axis. So that's what we do here. So we're, let's like transfer the data over, I'm just kind of show you what we're doing. Um, so for example, here, it's, let, we're focusing on Flint. Um, in 2007, Flint has an outcome of two. So 2007 outcome is two. In 2013, Flint's outcome is two. So we're gonna go two, two, Flint's gonna be right there, right? And we can do this with the other ones as well. So now we're focusing on Lansing, um, 2007, two, 2013, one, two, one. Okay, it's gonna be right here. Oh, oops, this, I have some arrows guiding us to what we're doing. So <laughs> 2000 and, um, yeah, 2007, two, 2013, one. Again, we're gonna be right there. Um, okay, you know, now we're getting the hang of it. Um, we can you know, slide over Kalamazoo, one, three, one, three, Kalamazoo is gonna be up there. Okay, so now that we've sort of expressed this, this data uh, in a new way, we're gonna focus just on this new expression of, of the same information. Um, and what I want you to you know, see is that synthetic control is all about taking weighted averages of the control units, right? So you know, the most simple weighted average we can take of Lansing and Kalamazoo is just a 50-50 weighted average, right? And that's gonna end up right in the middle. Um, we can take a 75 Kalamazoo, 25 Lansing weighted average, um, and that's gonna end up you know, sort of towards Kalamazoo from the, from the unweighted average, or we could take the 2575, right? And then we're gonna be closer to Lansing. And basically by toggling the weights here, we can, um, you know, take any uh, uh, weighted average of Kalamazoo and Lansing, um, and it's gonna just basically be this line that connects them um, on this new plot. So any of these trends are now possible, but just by taking weighted averages of Kalamazoo and Lansing. Um, we also had Detroit on the last plot, so I can put Detroit on this, on this new plot. And we could take any of the weighted averages between Lansing and Detroit if we're just using them. Um, you know, and if we're just using Kalamazoo and Detroit, we can take any of the weighted averages between them. Um, and, and actually, if we're willing to take weighted averages of all three, um, we, can, we can get anywhere in this triangle, anywhere in between um, uh, Lansing, Detroit, and Kalamazoo in this triangle. Um, and this is called the convex hole. Um, and so this is sort of the space of common trends that we unlock once we're sort of willing to take weighted averages. So if, because Flint here is actually within the convex hole, it means that there is a combination of Lansing, Kalamazoo, and Detroit that will exactly match Flint's pretrend. Um, uh, so you can see here, actually, the real combination is what I said earlier. It's 0.5 Lansing, 0.33 Kalamazoo, 0.17 Detroit. And you can actually see that just as a function of how close Flint is to Lansing, Kalamazoo, and Detroit um, in this variable space. Um, so again, this is all made up data. We're, we're going to find the real solution in a sec. Um, but just to talk a little bit more about synthetic control, um, sometimes Flint is still going to be uh, outside the convex hole, right? Um, and so you're, you're not actually going to be able to get um, match trend, Flint's trends perfectly. And this is sort of usually the case, then, right? Because we don't just have two data points. We have you know, a pre -pre -pre pretreatment panel of 10 or more data points. Um, but you're actually always going to do equally as well, or if not better, um, with synthetic control than you would do um, you know, just using one of the data points alone. So you can see here, even though um, with uh, Detroit and Lansing, um, we're not able to match Flint's pre-trends pre exactly, we can get pretty close at this point right here. Um, it's a lot closer than we would, we would be able to get just by um, using Lansing, um, or even just by using a, a, an average of Lansing and Detroit, which would be kind of over here. Um, I just want to briefly note, there are methods for um, uh, synthetic control that extrapolate beyond the convex hole. Um, so the augmented synthetic control methods, some of, some of their variants do. Um, uh, and so, you know, we actually potentially can, can get, get outside the convex hole. Um, you, you sort of, you, 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 you get this problem, which is, well, how far are you allowed to extrapolate? Um, uh, you can, and so, so machine learning allows for extrapolation from the convex hole via negative weights, right? So we can kind of um, subtract Kalamazoo to get outside, for example. Um, but he, uh, here you um, need, uh, you know, regularization to, to prevent from overfitting. Um, so, so, you know, you don't want to extrapolate too much. Um, and so, uh, you know, some people use elastic net. There's a lot of different kind of varieties here. But, but in, in the case of Flint for, for this paper, we don't use any of these kind of fancier extrapolation outside the convex hole methods, basically just because we don't have enough data. We only have about 10 pretreatment years for Flint, um, which just isn't enough, uh, at least in, for, for our data to, to do this in a you know, robust way. Okay, so how do we implement our synthetic control? Um, first, we select the potential control units. Um, and, and um, you want to limit your uh, synthetic control unit set um, to, to uh, districts that you think would be plausible matches to Flint. Um, 
So you want to minimize apples to oranges comparisons. Um, then you use the algorithm to identify optimal weights. Um, so what's the weight of your potential control units that makes your synthetic flint? And then you can just make your uh, synthetic flint, um, which is the synthetic flint is going to have you know, outcomes for every year in the post period. And you can take the difference um, to estimate the causal effect. Um, so going back to this graph, which we have fraction economically disadvantaged and fraction black, um, and all the districts in the state of Michigan, where each district is a dot, and the size of the dot is uh, the number of students in that district. So we have Flint up here. Um, we're first going to just restrict um, the number of districts that can potentially ma match with Flint. Um, and we're going to do it by taking basically, Flint is really unique on these two dimensions, the fraction black and the fraction economically disadvantaged. So we're going to throw away all of these districts that don't really have any black or disadvantaged students. Um, and we're going to focus on um, these blue districts in the top right here um, that, that uh, are at least above the 90th percentile in, in one of these two uh, variables. Um, and so among these blue districts, these are the potential uh, synthetic control districts. We use this algorithm and it finds um, the combination of these, of these blue districts that, that minimizes the uh, uh, pretreatment um, distance to Flint's trend. Um, so it's going to be the best fit uh, for pretreatment Flint. Um, and we find um, it's these purple ones here. Uh, and, and you know the paper has a list of exactly which ones they are and, and what the weights are. But now that we've identified synthetic flint, um, we can you know go back to this plot of Flint's math achievement uh, and we can you know just basically add in synthetic flint and see you know how it looks in our in our post period. So here we have synthetic flint um, with similar pretreatment trend is increasing along with flint, and then it decreases like a small amount, right? But not nearly as much as the decrease that we observe in flint. Um, so the difference between these two things, again, is going to be the causal effect. Um, and you know, for that reason, uh, there's actually sort of a different way of expressing this exact same data. Uh, it's called a gap plot, right? So instead of plotting two lines, we're just going to plot the difference between those two lines. Um, so here are kind of another way of visualizing our synthetic control results. So the difference in math achievement between Flint and synthetic Flint. And we see in the pretreatment period, their difference is pretty small. And in the post-treatment period, um, we see that the difference is um, negative and, and actually like pretty large. Um, and it is statistically significant. Um, so pretreatment, kind of small difference, post-treatment, kind of causal effect. Um, so, so this confidence interval that you see here is estimated empirically. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it. You can use uh, conformal inference, or you can use uh, jackknife. Um, but, but you know, what's cool about these standard errors, especially relative to difference in differences, is that they quantify two kinds of uncertainty. So um, this first kind of uncertainty is which districts comprise synthetic flint, and how stable are those districts to the decisions that we've made. And then whether the synthetic flint and actual flint are, are statistically different. So that's kind of the classic sampling variance. So, um, so, so these standard errors, I think, are really cool. Um, so here is the results for special needs, right? We see um, kind of pretreatment fit pretty good in the pre-period, and then we see that increase in the post-period. Um, so there's a decrease in amount achievement, increase in special needs in flint, um, and then we don't really see anything with reading achievement or attendance. Um, so again, so they're, they're not statistically different from zero in the, in the post-period, so kind of no effects there. Um, in terms of robustness, we run our synthetic control like 21 different ways, um, just to kind of uh, make sure that uh, it's not sensitive to different decisions. So, um, you know, we test for selective attrition, student movement um, across Michigan. Um, what's nice is that we can follow them. Uh, you know, we see kids even if they move away. So we have different ways of defining our sample. Um, we can use a smaller set of control districts that are more like Flint, right? So what if we, what if our, you know, we, we didn't restrict our initial control sample enough? Um, and we so we use 27 districts rather than 64 that are even more similar to Flint um, in terms of uh, percent black and percent ECD and and, not, um, and then we also fit out each, each outcome individually you know make a separate synthetic Flint for for each of our outcomes and, and in smaller combinations too and and basically none of our results uh, change um, in some of these analyses we get suggestive um, effects on on reading achievement but they're not uh, in this you know negative effects on reading achievement but but you know they're not robust through all the specifications so we, we don't really uh, read into those too much. Um, so, so the overall effect of the Flint water crisis. So there's really substantial negative effects of the Flint water crisis on student outcomes. Um, so that's a 0.14 standard deviation decrease in math achievement um, and a 9% increase in special needs. Um, and these effects are, are pretty large in the education literature, especially when you um, sort of account for the fact that uh, uh, they're negative, or, or at least in the case of math achievement. Um, okay, but so now we're gonna transition to the second part of the talk, which is, can we better understand the role that lead played in these observed effects? So we're, we're moving from the between Flint or between district analysis to the within Flint analysis, um, and so um, here we're going to use um, GIS data. So it's it's really unique and really cool data. And so it's Flint property level service line data, 
Um, so basically, it tells us what kind of um, service line what uh, a house has. Um, so it can be copper or lead, by and large. There's a few galvanized steel. Um, I can talk about that, but um, not as many as copper and lead. Um, so, so basically, this data was collected after the Flint water crisis when they actually dug up all the pipes um, and, just, and saw which ones were made of lead and which ones needed to be replaced. Um, and, and so for this reason, this sort of data doesn't really exist around the country very often. It's we do, like lead pipes are sort of distributed in older cities um, and we don't really know where they are. And it's, and it's often pretty expensive even just to look and it's even more expensive to, to change them. So Flint has spent you know, hundreds of millions of dollars replacing um, all of its lead pipes. And it's, it's almost done now, not, not entirely. Um, so we have data on 92% of residences, right? So I said, we're almost done replacing, but not entirely. Um, and about 40% of those residences have lead pipes, just to give you an idea of like our treatment group versus our control group. Um, so here's a, a map of Flint. Um, this is the airport down here, but this is sort of the core of the city. You can actually see the Flint River running through. Um, and um, in red here are the, uh, the, the parcels of land um, with houses on them that had lead service lines. So um, you, know, you can just sort of see the distribution of lead pipes throughout the city, for sure more common in older areas of the city, but, but also sort of um, you know, spread out throughout. So in, you know, we're kind of using the variation um, uh, you know, between neighbors, right? Like what if you know, the thought experiment could be that um, I don't have lead pipes, but my neighbor does. Um, and how do we sort of react differently to the change in water? Um, uh, and so what we do is we match each student's education record to their pipes, um, uh, their house's pipe material using their home address. So I just want to flag this was like really difficult. This is part of why the, the project has dragged for so long is that, um, you know, we actually had to get the Michigan Attorney General to sign a piece of paper to allow us to do this. So um, it was kind of a lot of work. Um, but anyway, so we have this cool data. Um, and what this new data lets us do is um, rather than uh, you know, uh, you know, just look at this trend of math achievement um, over time um, for all of Flint, we can actually break it out into two lines, right? So we can break it out into um, the copper and the lead. And we see actually the kids with copper pipes and the kids with lead pipes um, have very similar trends, both in the pre-treatment pre -treatment period and in the post-treatment period. Um, so we actually don't see big differences um, in, for example, either the increase before or the decrease after. Uh, uh, as a function of what kind of pipes a, a kid had. Again, I want to flag these are older children, so potentially like not the most susceptible to lead. Um, and we actually, so you know, we can fit those models in a kind of a sophisticated way using difference and differences that control for a lot more things. And, um, and we, you know, there's actually been a big sort of uh, change, like a lot of changes in difference and differences over time, and people are realizing difference and differences are a lot more susceptible to um, things like treatment he effect heterogeneity or uh, um, among individuals or effects that change over time. Um, so we use this new uh, difference and difference imputation estimator um, uh, and some, some last names that I, I don't really know how to pronounce, to be honest. And um, so, you know, we have the difference and difference results. Um, and basically we, you know, they're the same as that figure that I just showed you uh, right before where we don't really see any significant differences um, between the pre and post period uh, between the lead and the copper people. Um, so, so really it doesn't seem like lead was, was a big driver of those um, uh, effects that we observed in the synthetic control analysis. So kind of synthesizing these results, um, empirically lead explains um, very little of the observed math effects. Um, and so one question you can ask is how much of these effects would we expect from lead? And I'm focusing on the math effects because we just have a, a stronger prior on, on how lead relates to test scores than we do with, for example, special needs classification. Um, and, and so the answer is actually not a lot. Um, so if you recall, there was a, only a 0.5 microgram per deciliter in, increase in Flint. This was enough to put a lot of kids sort of over the threshold um, because you know, Flint's an area where there actually already is a lot of um, uh, lead from paint anyways. Um, so so th this did lead to a genuine increase in kids over the CDC threshold. It increased the you know, lead exposure of kids on average. Um, but, but, th but this um, 0.5 microgram per deciliter isn't huge. Um, so like the best evidence from past studies is that, is that um, we would expect a, a 0 0.01 or 0 0.015 standard deviation effect per 0.5 microgram de per deciliter. So kind of comparing these effect sizes, right? They're about an order of magnitude different, right? Um, so basically, like empirically, we see that the lead doesn't explain much of the observed math effects. And actually theoretically, it explains pretty little of the math effects. Um, so, so what I want to flag is, is that it doesn't necessarily mean um, that there weren't effects of lead on children in Flint. Again, sort of we're looking at kids that are older. So I, I think we have reason to believe that like the social just mechanisms might increase with age, right? Um, we have sort of the magnitude of effects in age here. And this is just sort of theoretical, right? But, but um, the social mechanisms might grow, right? Like disruptions from school, kids sort of understand the stigma, the marginalization, the social unrest, um, they're a part of it. 
Um, but the health mechanisms might decrease over time. This is sort of our just biological theories about how lead affects the body. It's like, as you get older, you're, you're not sort of in a neurodevelop neurodevelopmental period. Your, your body is larger, so, it's, it's, so small amounts of lead do less harm. Um, and I just think in the case of Flint and, and the, the data that we're examining, I think we're something here, right? I think we're in a case where the social mechanisms are relatively large, but the, but the health mechanisms, the biological effects of lead are, are pretty small. And so how do we interpret all this? Um, so you know, among, among the children, we say the social effects of the crisis, the sort of the things that weren't involved about lead were actually large compared to the health effects. Um, and this means that we actually currently substantially underestimate the cost of the Flint water crisis. So the sort of existing estimates of like how bad of this was, how bad was this for society um, were used basically just the effects of lead, that 0.5 micrograms per deciliter and not these overall effects that I'm showing. Um, and, and so, you know, these existing estimates range from like 50 to like $400 million. Um, but the social component is actually a, a big part of the story. And so I think the true negative costs of the, of the Flint, or the, the true cost of the Flint water crisis were, were much bigger. Um, so going back to our kind of toy model where structural forces, you know, affect the probability of the failure of public institutions that affect environmental health exposures that in turn affect child development. I mean, I think what we're kind of seeing in, is, is that the failing of public institutions plays an important role in and of itself. Right. So, and, and again, we can really just with the data we have, we can just speculate to, to why uh, the Flint water crisis affected kids, not through lead pathways. Um, but, but, you know, I think some of the candidate mechanisms are stigma, marginalization, social unrest. Um, so to, to sum things up, you know, this, that synthetic control provides new avenues to estimating causal effects. Um, I think it's useful in sociology and demography because sometimes we're interested in specific historical events um, and, and, and it's difficult to find counterfactuals in those cases. Um, so you know, there were substantial negative effects of the Flint water crisis on affected children. Um, and there was large social effects in addition to whatever the health effects may be. And again, we cannot speak to sort of how the kids below the age of five might've been affected. Um, and, I, and I think just this, this suggests that it's not sufficient to treat this crisis merely as a public health crisis, it's something more than that. Um, and know basically we just hope this research draws attention to the huge cost of these water crises. Um, you know, these water crises produce inequality across plates and, and actually the preventative measures are, are relatively inexpensive. Um, and um, anyways, you know, it's a flag that like the Flint water crisis was intended to save about $5 million. And, and so updated social costs range from hundreds of millions of dollars to, to even billions of dollars. So, um, oh wow, somebody's drawing. I didn't even know uh, that was an option. But uh, that is all I have for you. And um, I'm excited to talk. Wonderful, thank you so much for that talk, Sam. Um, so we have a, quite a few questions and um, I'm gonna just, call on people to unmute and ask their questions. So we the, the first comment is a question from Ron and then Ron also had a question um, uh, later on as well. Ron, do you want to just unmute and, and ask? Uh, okay, uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, well, the first question is hardly worth mentioning. It just looked to me like the trend, going back to the shooting analysis, it looked to me like the trend in the control districts was stronger than the trend in in uh, the shooting districts. And so that would somewhat weaken the results relative to their true impact. That, that was my take on that. But on the Flint, I was wondering whether the fact that there were, well, whether there'd be spillover effects from the kids coming from uh, homes with lead uh, in school onto the kids who were coming from homes with copper piping because it would have an effect on the whole, the speed with which the teacher could move through the curriculum and that sort of thing. But I doubt that would be enough to have anything observable effect on the results. Anyway, that was my, that was my oh, question or my point. No, I think it's a good, I think it's a good point um, about spillovers. And I think there's even other pathways, um, like, you know, other ways for spillovers. So there, it could be right, yeah, like if, if the average peer effect changes in Flint, um, well, now all of a sudden treatment of uh, the, the kid with lead pipes is affecting the kid with copper pipes. And so our estimates of the effects are biased downwards or biased towards zero. Um, no, I think that's absolutely right. I, in a, another way I think spillovers are potentially a problem is like really just kids drinking water at each other's houses, right? So um, in the thought experiment of like next door neighbors, uh, like, you know, if I'm friends with my next door neighbor, I might spend a lot of time there. And, and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, in some sense our treatment variable like is measured with error. Um, so I think that that's a reason to think um, you know, and another way that our treatment variable could be measured with error is that um, we, 
you know, we don't observe other sources of lead within homes, for example, like lead fixtures. So, um, um, you know, sinks and things like that that have lead. And, and so, so we only observe a portion basically of the total lead exposure um, and there might be some spillover. So I think those are all reasons that we see kind of smaller effects. Um, but I think even just theoretically thinking about how much lead was exposed to kids, um, it, I think for me it at least shows that there's enough evidence that, that there was a substantial amount of kind of non-lead effects too. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so there's a couple of comments there. So I'm going to skip the comments, Sam, because I think um, you can just read through them. So I'll move on to the next question um, by Ken. Ken, do you want to ask your question? Okay, I'll ask it a little differently from in the chat. It's a very stimulating talk and introduces our students too to a new method that's popular and for which you're an enthusiast. But many statisticians are very skeptical of synthetic control. And you talked about the mechanics of doing it, but th there's a wider question about what could be the causal story. This is trying to support an argument about causality. Now, in the ordinary difference in differences, your control is some it's going to come from a place where you can see the similarities with the treatment group. You make the control as alike as the treatment group. But in synthetic control, you're taking a bunch of places which are often visibly unlike the treatment group. They have all kinds of different trends. And it's a mathematical fact that you can, with enough degrees of freedom, construct a, uh, a trend to match the other trend. But the causal stories in all these different places where the outcomes before the treatment time are different, those causes may all be very different. And so why is there any reason in your view that you can then say, okay, this linear combination of places very different in observed ways from the place you care about then tells you what's going to happen in the place you care about uh, in the future if you didn't have the water crisis. I mean, you're a believer, but there are lots of unbelievers. So could you as a believer speak to uh, why you feel synthetic control gives you causal inference? Yeah, um, and I, I, it's a really good question. And I think in some sense, like mm, my answer might be a little bit more that like, not that like, I think that, uh, you know, sort of difference in difference, is, or I think, I think that synthetic control is as good as what other people think difference in difference is. And, and I think really the opposite is I kind of think difference in difference is as bad as what other people think synthetic control is. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, so I, I think I'm a little bit skeptical um, by this notion of, you know, the kind of the storytelling that accompanies, um, you know, whether or not it's a good or bad counterfactual. So, you know, for example, initially when people started running synthetic control, they would do the exact same thing. Um, but they would, so the initial paper that I, I mentioned, people kind of departed from um, in, in kind of meaningful ways, but, but they would, there would be this, um, try to create the story of like, well, let's look at how similar synthetic flint is to actual flint on observables, right? So we actually are able, you know, in the same way that you know, people might make some argument about like in some agricultural way, Texas can resemble Oklahoma and run a difference in differences. People were sort of making these um, claims about the linear combinations. Uh, you know, I guess I think I'm, I'm sort of more motivated by like to what extent does it accurately capture the pre-trends and, and how sensitive is that? So, so I think that the standard errors, like in some sense, I, I don't like how sometimes difference and differences really have this nice clean story, right? Where, where oh, like there's these two places that are really similar um, uh, and they happen to have the, the pre-trend perfect. But all of that in many ways, I think happens outside the paper, right? So, so people are um, basically testing a lot of things and then seeing like which places that, that resemble the place also have matching pre-trends and then kind of use that. And, and you're basically conditioning your analysis on some pre-analysis that exists, that, that, that happens either sort of like theoretically or empirically, but like outside the paper. Like there, there is this process that I guess what I'm saying is that we have to go through for counterfactual selection. And I think it's sort of messy. And I think that, um, you know, synthetic control forefronts it. So like an, another way to think about synthetic control um, that would be sort of a happy medium between difference and differences that I think speaks to what you're saying is like, you could you could constrain different or synthetic control uh, to only select 
um, either sort of unweighted averages or a single control unit, right? So then at least you're, you're, bake, you're able to bake in the uncertainty from this counterfactual selection process like into your standard errors in a way that sort of difference in difference doesn't. Okay. Thanks, good. Great. Um, so we have a question from one of our students in public health. Bobby, do you want to ask your question? And maybe this is um, related to what Ken was thinking about as well, perhaps. Yeah, this is definitely related and less profound, but um, yeah, sort of because synthetic control, you know, you match on the pretreatment trends, you know, they'll, they'll kind of diverge just by chance in the post-treatment. And it sounds like you made this figure, but I always find what, what helps me kind of buy them more, I guess, is like plotting the individual like places that you have in the synthetic control against the, the you know, the Flint trends and see how it was individually different, you'd expect, you know, maybe Flint would be at the bottom of that distribution. So I'm curious if you have that graph and what it might look like. I do not have that graph. So you're just saying like a, uh, like rather than presenting the weighted average, just do like present something that is a scatter plot with Flint and like any district that sort of has a non-zero weight in synthetic control? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's basically like to plot that relative to other ones because it's possible maybe like one of the control places has like a similarly strong downward trend or something like that. Uh, I know people kind of like, maybe it doesn't mean as much when it's like a smaller collection of synthetic controls, but I don't know, that always has helped me, I, you know, believe that the difference between the, the controls and the treatment is significant or meaningful, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I do not think I sort of understand. So so what, so what? say that you were to see like Flint um, alongside, you know, all like, like, let's just say there are like, you know, six or 10 other districts. I don't, what are you looking for visually to see, to, to sort of be more convinced? Like, um, I just think like seeing them all together, like individually would be helpful just cause like maybe there's like in the synthetic control there's one that goes like way up or something like that. And that just like brings the, the average up a lot. And then if you actually like plotted it, maybe a lot of them have the same downward trend. So like kind of the concern that what if the results of the synthetic control are like being driven by like one particular, uh, you know, one particular unit that happens to make, make the synthetic control. Is that, is that kind of the question? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see how the plot you're describing would help with that. Um, now I'm sorry that I don't have it. Uh, I do think what's, so what's nice is like the standard errors do account for like um, in some sense, like the stability of the, the synthetic control as you uh, resample, you know, time unit, time and control units. So like, like if, if there was like, for example, one unit that's like had a really kind of weird trend and seem to be like driving the like larger difference between synthetic Flint and actual Flint, um, then it should show up in the standard errors, but, but yeah. Okay, we're, we're actually over time, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna take two more minutes and let Will ask his question. Casey, maybe you can stick around for the student session and ask your question. So I'm gonna skip you, Casey, and, and just let Will um, ask his question and then we'll end. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I just really appreciated the, this careful analysis. I, I'm curious in the between models that you were doing, you spoke to the possible measurement error and, and responding to Ron. And you said that you know, theoretically, you don't see that the any attenuation bias could be enough to explain the lack of results of the, uh, the, the lead effects. But I was scouring the paper and I really didn't see where you came up with that because we know that these types of models can be really sensitive. To, uh, to, to measurement error and causing attenuation bias. Gotcha, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think what I meant there was not theoretically that measurement error couldn't kind of like bias the results downward enough. I think I was just combining, like, I think there are some limitations. Uh, I think you're talking about with the within Flint results, like comparing the lead pipes to the proper pipes. Like, uh, so, so I think there's some reason, you know, basically we get null effects there. I think there's some reasons we can think that those effects might be closer to zero than they like ought to be. Um, there's, there's not much we can do about some of those. Like in some sense, I'm trying to answer the question as best as I can, like answer the, the question about what happened in Flint as best as we can with the, given the data and it's an event that happened one place at one time. But, but what I was saying about sort of theoretically, I was saying that like basically the prior literature on lead, like we do know something about like 
how the Flint water crisis changed the amount of blood lead levels in children. And I'm saying, I was saying theoretically, like if we compare what we would have expected from just lead effects um, to what we observe with our synthetic control estimates, which I want to highlight, like contains both the kids who would have been exposed to lead and the kids who wouldn't have been exposed to lead. Like, like the lead, the like the the amount of like sort of the de decrease in academic achievement as a function of um, you know whatever amount of lead exposure we know happened in Flint would have to be much 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 like orders of magnitude higher than uh, like what the literature says. So, th so that's what I was saying. I didn't mean theoretically measurement error couldn't attenuate uh, uh, estimates. I was saying theoretically, like it's it's pretty hard to imagine. Uh, the, the, the amount of lead causing effects on achievement that would explain, that would fully explain the, the uh, between district, the, so like the synthetic control results. All right, great. Um, so we are way over time, so I apologize for that. Thank you everyone for sticking around. Let's unmute and thank Sam for a wonderful um, talk.